Let's take a look at the role of the mass media with socialization. Um, obviously, it's become much more uh, intricate and involved in the last uh, 40 or so years, 50 years. Um, mass media consisting of anything electronic or print that uh, carries messages and to widespread audiences. So, you know, think about this, okay? In 1950, a 13 inch black and white television cost $950. Most people at that time never dreamt that they'd be able to afford one. By the end of the 1950s, the cost was down around $200. And since the late 1950s, more homes have actually had a TV than a telephone. So, you know, that's a huge uh, influence upon the socialization of people during that time period uh, and, and ever since. In 1970, uh, that was the year in the spring of 70 is when the microchip was uh, created. And, and most people in 1970 had never seen a computer and yet look at the prevalence today. So, you know, when we talk about the socialization and the impact that it has on, on people, especially younger kids, you know, as a parent, this is kind of the stuff that you want your kids to see. You want to see, uh, you want to see them uh, experience the, you know, kind of the, the attitudes and the beliefs of, you know, Andy and Aunt B and Opie and Barney with his bullet. You know, that's good stuff, okay? But then these are the things that we kind of have to combat as parents today. And, uh, you know, what, whether it's South Park or uh, The Simpsons or what have you, you know, the things that you look at and you say, no, wait a minute, okay, you know, what do we want our kids to see? So that's where you get into kind of, you know, what role does media have? Does media reflect what's going on in terms of cultural change and, and what's taking place in our, our culture? Or does it project cultural changes? Now, obviously, it probably does both uh, and probably has a tremendous influence on both. Now, let's take the example real quick of Superman. Superman um, actually was uh, a character that was created in uh, the late 1930s, had a TV show uh, in the 1950s. And if you look at that during the 1950s, uh, basically the temperament and the attitudes of Clark, uh, Clark Kent and Superman were essentially identical. And they were constantly uh, in control. They were constantly rescuing uh, women um, and people in need. And, and the idea, kind of the underlying idea there was that all men were essentially capable of being Superman. Now, Lois, on the other hand, uh, Lois was kind of a bumbling fool early on in the 50s, and, uh, you know, she was uh, mesmerized by Superman. She wanted to marry Superman. Her career was totally secondary. Yes, she worked at the Daily Planet, but um, that had nothing over, you know, her desire uh, for Superman. Now, if we progress, you know, and, and take a look, for example, at some of the 70s movies, um, Clark, okay, Clark Kent becomes much more sensitive as an individual. Uh, men in this time period, um, it, the whole sensitivity movement, if you want to call it that, was around where uh, guys were supposed to be more sensitive and, and more caring, uh, more open to sharing their feelings and their emotions, okay? Gender roles had, had differed by this point in time. Um, if you look like in the 90s, uh, there was a television show actually, uh, it was called uh, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. And by this point in time, you see that um, Lois was very career oriented. She was uh, uh, well renowned for what she did and she tended to have equal status. Even the title of the show indicates an equality between the two. So uh, this kind of goes back to the whole idea that, you know, uh, a lot of the things that we see in the media, they can both reflect and maybe even project some changes uh, within our culture. Okay. Now, let's take a look at media from 
the various perspectives. Uh, from a functionalist view, basically this emphasizes the role of media in reaffirming proper behavior um, within people. So you learn appropriate and non-appropriate uh, behavior from you know, various things in the media. That's, that's kind of the functionalist view. To, uh, it also serves a, obviously as a function of, of getting information uh, transferred to the masses in a very quick uh, able way. So now you can also see that mass media is capable of uh, conferring status and prestige on people. If you look for example um, after 9-11 uh, firemen uh, or firefighters, police officers, you know, the, the whole uh, prestige of them influence uh, or increased dramatically after uh, the disasters of 9-11. Now there is one dysfunction in terms of all this stuff taking place, uh, whether it be in TV or newspapers, what, uh, what have you. And it's what we call the narcotizing dysfunction. This is where media provides so much information, massive amounts of information, that sometimes the audience becomes numb and basically fails to react in various situations. So if you think about it, uh, for example, on television or in the news, you hear about so many uh, murders and crimes being committed that, you know, there's a point where you get to the point where it becomes numbing. And that's, uh, again, what we refer to as the narcotizing dysfunction of the media. Now, from a conflict view, Okay, remember conflict view, we're thinking of, you know, who's in control, who's not. And uh, if we look at this, basically the conflict view of the media reflects many of the divisions that our society and our world has, uh, especially when you talk about gender, race, ethnicity, social class, all of that. Okay, now who's in control? Well, we talk, we, we talk about these people as the gatekeepers, okay? Uh, gatekeeping is a term that refers to the path that uh, the material must travel uh, through kind of a series of checkpoints or gates, as you may want to call it, before it actually reaches the public. Now, the conflict perspective suggests that uh, the gate, this, this gatekeeping process maximizes profits for some while kind of filtering uh, the representation of others uh, in the media. Now, who tends to be in control? Well, wealthy white males. Those are the people who tend to be in control. And what can occur a lot of times as a result of this is the creation of various stereotypes. Um, when the media may portray a certain group of people in a certain way or other that may not be totally accurate because the people who are making these decisions are not uh, necessarily informed uh, a lot of times. Now, the other big issue today with the conflict perspective and media uh, would be, for example, unequal access to the media. Let's talk about the internet for just a second. Um, if you look at the, the more wealthy schools around the country today, all of them have internet access available to their students. In, in many cases, students have computers 24-7 and they have access to, to the internet and to all kinds of uh, information and so on. But if you look at some of the less wealthy or some of the poorer districts around America, you'll find many students lack that access to the media. So uh, it's definitely a situation where it's like the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Okay? Let's take a look from the feminist perspective. Okay, Jean Kilburn, she's the one that uh, we're going to look at in terms of uh, the video Killing Us Softly. But she talks about women in particular in the media and in like advertisements. And she says that uh, women are basically dehumanized. 
Um, we'll talk about that a lot in class. If you look at the roles that women play um, on television and, and in movies and things like that, very frequently you will find women needing to be rescued by men. I mean, still to this day, it's kind of the old um, thing where men are in control, women are needing assistance in some way. Um, occasionally you will see women in leadership roles and, and prominent roles, but uh, it's becoming more prevalent today, but um, it's still not equal in terms of how they're treated. Uh, and a lot of times you will see violence against women, and it almost, um, in, from a feminist perspective, they say it, it basically kind of normalizes that. It says, okay, here's what you're seeing on TV or in the movies, and it's being done there. It must be okay to do. So, Now, from the interactionist perspective, remember the interactionists have no major theory that they're trying to play out in terms of society, uh, you know, on a societal scale. But interactionists are very uh, interested in the shared understandings of uh, day, a, everyday behavior. Uh, they examine the impact of media on kind of a micro level to see how media shapes the day-to-day -day, uh, behavior of people. Um, they're very interested, for example, in sexual expression, privacy issues, censorship, all of those things related to internet issues um, and, and how they impact, again, social behavior. So um, politicians, celebrities, a lot of times will uh, um, use the whole concept of photo ops to try and uh, promote themselves. You know, a lot of uh, celebrities will actually have their um, their media people that they hire. They will call and let magazines know when, you know, about what time and, and where that certain media people will be, uh, you know, maybe going to a party or, or attending certain event because they want all those photo ops. Uh, that's a big deal for them. So... This is all just ways that the the uh, media influences to influences us today. It's much much more technological and uh, much more detailed than we've ever had before. And to be quite honest, with you know uh, the smartphones and and the technology getting even better and better, it's going to do nothing but get worse in terms of uh, you know the lack of privacy and and the impact that. Uh, media is going to have on socialization.